Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the, the Women of Cloud panel. Uh, my name is Ray Wang. I'm a product, group product manager at GCP. I'm also the moderator of this panel. So we all love coming to tech conferences, right? They're really exciting, all the great sessions, new product announcements. But we also find that sometimes it's where we get a little lonely. After you spend you know, three days of sitting in rooms full of men, it's really hard not to wonder how come there aren't more women around. So a few of us decided to create a session at Next where we can get together with all of you as a group to talk about how to make the tech world, especially cloud, a better place for women and how we can help each other to succeed and to enjoy working in this industry. So here we've got um, a panel of um, very senior uh, technical women at GCP. They span five different disciplines, three cities, two continents. Um, so I'm going to introduce them first, and then I will ask them a number of questions that, that we have collected from the tech women communities. Um, after that, we're going to open uh, the floor and invite you to bring your questions and thoughts to discuss with our panelists and the audience. So here is our wonderful panel. Uh, first, we start with Christina. Christina is our UX manager leading the user experience for our DevOps um, tools. She has been in the industry for 25 years and is pretty aware of being a few and far between. But she's also very hopeful and excited um, about the constant progress that she has seen through the years. Then we have Kripa. Um, Kripa is the director of technical program management at GCP, which means her organization uh, is, in, is in charge of all the tools and frameworks that we use for collaboration, execution, and planning. Kripa's career has wandered through um, theater and music, Within Google, she's also known as the queen of karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Melody. Uh, you might have seen her from this morning's keynote. Uh, Melody is a VP of engineering um, in charge of the entire DevOps tools division. She manages a very diverse uh, team of engineers, um, close to 1,000 engineers around the world. She has been in Google for 14 years, since the early days, and she has led products in uh, both search and cloud. Outside of work, um, Melody is a single mom and a sports coach for her awesome nine-year-old daughter. And we have Ness. And Ness is our lead pro product manager in cloud networking, one of the nerdiest areas. <laughs> she is the mom of two young kids, and she has traveled a lot. She has taken her career around the world, from Spain to Sweden to the Bay Area. And then over there, we have Grace Mollison. Grace is a cloud solutions architect. She's based out of London. She has the coolest accent of us all. <laughs> she flies around the world, uh, meets with our largest customers to help them to design cloud architectures. So let's go to the, some of the questions that we have collected from the recent um, tech community events. First question, where did your glamour or passion for this work first begin? We have, I know both Grace and uh, Kripa have interesting stories there. Okay, sitting at the end obviously didn't work. <laughs> right, um, so I was, I'm actually a chemistry graduate, graduate and um, I was, um, ended up looking after all the PCs. And uh, from there I then thought, well oh, great, this, this, this computing stuff is fun. Much more fun than chemistry. So um, I then uh, decided to look for a job where I could get deeper into, chemi uh, into computing. And I found a job with GSK, whereby they wanted scientists who had an aptitude for computing, but could talk to the scientists, if you see, sort of thing. And then it's just been downhill from there, really. <laughs> well, um, I had exposure to computers very, very early on in my life, very, very young. But um, as I got older, I tried everything in my power not to be in tech, everything. I was in a band, in a theater group, I went to med school, then quit med school. I do all sorts of things. My parents were even worried I would do anything with my life at all. Um, clearly, <laughs> clearly I took the other left and then ended up in tech, but I love it over here ever since. But you know, eventually I took a computer science class um, by accident. It was an elective that fit the credits I needed. And the professor was so outstanding. He didn't teach me to code. He said, here, have this notebook. He gave me an ANSI C book, I think. He said, go learn it on your own. And um, he made us learn everything that happened behind the scenes. So how stacks grow and shrink, what happens, you know, like heap garbage collection. That's what he taught us as an entry-level CS class. And then that was it. And here I am. So. Cool. Anybody else? Melody? <laughs> I grew up on a farm. 
<laughs> no. no, I really did. I have all sorts of skills that none of my colleagues know that I have. I can drive tractors. I can deliver cows. Um, so no one in my family understands what I do. Uh, but I got interested in science at a very early age. Um, I took some programming. I took my first programming class in high school. And I was just so fascinated by what I felt like was this blend of science and problem solving and creativity. And I was hooked. And that's it. So no more tractors. <laughs> cool. All right, the next question. Um, what was the most memorable moment when you felt strong organizational support as a woman in tech? Why don't we start from Christina? I would say that was the moment when I understood the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. And I've had the great fortune of having strong sponsors in my entire career. And it's a really interesting, impactful moment when you realize that there's this executive person in the organization that you work at, and that person is looking out for you. And it's you, all of a sudden, the emotional signal it sends is that you want to do so much better than you're already doing just to make that person proud because they're advocating for you. So that, for me, is the most memorable moment. And if you think about the fact that I came to Google only two years ago in my career, you know, just giving you a small example, I had just gotten here and I immediately was added to an executive leadership program. It's a one-year-long program in which also I got assigned uh, an executive talent coach. So with that coach, I can... I can discuss all kinds of things like how I grow my organization, how we scale, how I also do the same thing for my group, you know, for my team that is underneath me to grow talent and to be a sponsor for many people. So that's pretty much the most memorable part for me. And then Christina and I were, were part of a cohort. We did that executive um, co coaching program together and they even gave us a t-shirt that says self-rescuing princess. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have um, stories about coaching and um, the mentorship, sponsorship? I, I have a similar story, but I also, you know, I got uh, lucky enough in which uh, also I had a, a, a manager boss that actually was a male. And he was super supportive of building diversity. And uh, he wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, he showed me working... <laughs> way too many hours, <laughs> and then maybe thought that, you know, I could have some uh, interest, motivation for getting stuff done. But uh, it was as well very uh, conscious about uh, making sure that I could actually capitalize of that work and that effort, which it was never in my strength. So because, you know, sometimes you just keep working thinking, you know, that things are going to happen for you. And then he recognized very early on that I wasn't going to make it. I mean, I was going to be fine, like I was doing so much work that sure, I'll make it. But I was never going to shine uh, unless I could recognize how much, you know, value I was bringing. So he was helping me to uh, kind of uh, understand the value I was bringing and uh, give visibility to it. So I've been very thankful for all his efforts. And from that time on, I think I gained confidence. So I, I, I felt that, you know, I bring things to the table that I can, you know, I was overcompensating for work. So sometimes you need a little bit of help from others to recognize that, you know, you are there for a reason and uh, help you shine. Anybody else to add? Okay, all right, let's go to the next question. Um, what's one of the most exciting things you or your team have worked on recently? Since Melody has the mic, why don't we start with you? <laughs> I, I am a little bit overjoyed right now. Um, and part of the reason that I feel that way is that my team has been working. So I lead developer and operations tools for Google. So that includes Google engineers, teams within Google doing open source development, mobile development, uh, and then developers using Google's cloud platform, developers and operators. And um, we've, le we've learned some lessons within Google. And part of what we announced today was uh, the components that comprise the end-to-end -end DevOps platform and tooling on GCP. And we're just beginning. The thing that inspires me uh, to do my work 
uh, with my team and with developers and operators is that as an, as an engineer early in my career, it, everything was focused on what I like to call the hammer, the thing that we were building, right? And this work that, that we're doing right now in DevOps and in SRE and in operations, it's all about us, like us as developers and operators and creators, about how we can be productive and how we can be happy doing this work, taking our ideas and, and bringing them to life. And so I'm incredibly inspired and excited by that opportunity for GCP to contribute to that. Uh, and also to work with so many great open source tools. Today in the keynote, we showed a couple examples of that. To work with our partners. Uh, another part of this is just collaboration. Like how we do this together is what matters. How we connect with each other, how we connect in the community to support each other. And yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. <laughs> it's going to be an amazing couple of years to see what happens. Cool. Christina, since you own the user experience part of that work, do you want to tell us about how you build user experience? This is not a small task to build experiences over all the things that Melody owns. I tell you that because in, in the entire engineering stack that Melody drives at Google, there are products that run only in-house, so only inside Google, and all the internal engineers at Google use those. And the bar is very high. Sometimes I wonder if the bar is higher working with, with that audience versus, you know, with external, more kinder audiences. And <laughs> I am particularly excited about something that Melody is also sponsoring for us, to have extra researchers on the UX team that will look at whether code reviews are handled differently based on female or male engineers submitting something for code review. I get personally really excited about that because from a UX perspective, that lifts everything into an entirely different equivalence class. This is not the standard stuff that we all do that's bread and butter. This is something entirely different. And also talking to our external customers about that. I think those things are all from a human perspective game changers. I'm really, really excited about those. Great. And um, Kripa, why don't you tell us what does, what's exciting pro program management these days? So our, if you, the role of my organization originally was to help transform the way we work in cloud to be something that is much more um, palatable by, for, you know, for enterprise audiences. We were not cut that way at Google. We were very much a Let's go innovate. Let's build a thing. And then we do cool stuff. And then the cool stuff matters to people. And they will use it because it's cool is where we come from. You come with that. And then someone says, give me a roadmap. We're all, what? Like, what does that mean? Like, two years out? We don't know how to do that. Like, we're not that, right? So um, I think the most amazing thing that we've ever done is like, we put small incremental things in place to really change in the last two, three years, maybe from a group that literally, this was an app, and the FAQ would say, hey, what is a roadmap? That, that, that's where we started, right? To where we are right now, where, you know, that kind of execution. So it, it's, a, it's a transformation of an organizational culture. It's not just about, I set up process. It's getting everybody to buy into it. It's still work in progress. It was a massive, you know, moment of accomplishment when we realized we could actually deliver one when, <laughs> when people said they needed it. So yeah, I think that's probably what's caused the most excitement. There's still a long ways to go because we want to get better and better at this. Um, so yeah, I think that's caused me. So well, they're ex it, whatever Melody said is basically how I feel about it, but our transformation is inside the organization as opposed to, to external customers and partners. Okay. I think uh, solution architects is probably another discipline that people don't hear as much about. So Grace, what's exciting there? Well, basically, the feedback you get from customers. So my, my role is to kind of essentially scale myself out of a job. So I, I basically, the idea is that we're trying to make our documentation easier to understand. We're trying to work on problems that, that maybe we haven't articulated clearly enough that customers can figure it out themselves. So I work with workshops and with customers. Um, I write content. I blog. Um, and um, I get the most joy when I'm sat in a, generally a room, mostly men, um, when we, we're kind of working through a problem and they come out and they say, okay, and then the next time they contact me is something that even I don't know, and then I know that I've done my job well. So, you know, that, that's what makes me get up in the mornings. Great. Okay, uh, I recently read a piece of data that um, um, we have a high rate of tech women dropping out mid-career. 
In fact, it's at twice the rate uh, that men would drop out from your career, and it's much higher than women dropping out in the other industries. So we know it's sometimes a tough environment. How do you remain motivated and persistent? Ines? We play who has the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's a great uh, insight. So I, I, I'll say uh, resilience is really uh, the, I found throughout my career is the most powerful attribute you can have. And, you know, life is hard. And it is hard for us as women. Um, it's hard for everyone as well. Uh, I think uh, you need to keep back uh, in the back of your mind all the time because you're eventually going to need it. I, I had uh, a need for going back to you know re remind myself uh, why I'm here. Many times through my career, in which you know you feel tempted to give up. It's hard. It's, uh, you feel like sometimes you're not understood, the conditions might not be optimal. Now, I, I think uh, uh, if you uh, keep up with the work and uh, you go back on why you started it on the first place, uh, why you are there, like you like to learn, you like to uh, 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 help others and innovate, uh, eventually it's going to come out and for me, Especially, I, um, you know, I, I, I've been working, as I, I was saying before, like I was work, working very hard through all my career. But at some point, you realize you're not going to make it just doing that. Like, you, you're going to make it, but uh, you need to find uh, uh, what is your strength and then leverage on that. You need to double down on that because... Uh, others are going to appreciate that uh, amplified um, as well. Uh, I had a great uh, opportunity when I came to Google, and it just happened that um, Cloud was starting, and I thought it was super cool. And I didn't even have a job as a product manager at the time, and I said, like, all right, I want to be here, I want to help. So eventually I took the challenge and, you know, went uh, through uh, the different steps that took me to be a product manager, to uh, do networking, which is what I love. And uh, it's been, like, four super hard uh, working years, but I decided I'll take the challenge and the opportunity reward. So I think it's just finding the right opportunity. Sorry, it took a little bit long. I Thank get you. really excited. Thank you. So, so, Melody, how do you help the women in your org to stay motivated? You always ask the tough questions, Ray. <laughs> I, I really believe in the, in the power and the energy of connecting with other people because we're all human, we're all imperfect, and um, we've done some things in, within my organization uh, some mentoring programs, we do a monthly lunch, um, we do career coaching for each other. Uh, has anyone read Brene Brown? Does anyone know Brene Brown? She is amazing. She studies, she's a, um, she's a data junkie, but she studies topics like trust and um, vulnerability. And one of the turning points for me in my career was to, to, be, to take the risk to be vulnerable with the people around me, both men and women in my organization, about what I was struggling with, what I needed help with, to be more proactive about asking for help. And I try and model that for everyone that I work with. It's not easy to do sometimes, to show up and be kind of a mess, but actually we're all kind of a mess, just some of us hide, a, hide it better than others. So I try and support people in my team and the women on my team in whatever way they need, and to really be honest about where there are challenges at different points in their life, mm -hmm. where um, there's a balance between work outside, or work, you know, your work life and your personal life and things that are happening for folks, taking care of parents or starting a family or um, relocating or changing your ladder. All these sorts of things affect us. And I think if we can be open uh, with each other and help each other, it makes such a huge difference because we all, we all work really hard uh, and tech is changing all the time. We're always learning. And um, if we can be there for each other, it makes a huge difference. That's a great point. And uh, just like Melody said, right, it's not always going to be you know, success and lunches. We're all happy congratulating each other. There's sometimes we fail. So now it's a, the heart-to-heart -heart moment. Like, I want to ask the panelists, when was the last time you failed? And how did you pick yourself up? And what did you learn? Kripa. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to have the mic. 
like, <laughs> and well, there, there is something there because I've had some spectacular failures, both at work and at home. Um, I, I have a couple of lessons. I had to, th I have a, <laughs> all right, let me start with some spectacular ones outside of work because there's something there too. Um, I really, really wanted to do anything not tech. I did not want to be anywhere near tech. And, and, um, but I was very techy even in that regard. And it entered, like the first manifestation of it was music. So I was in a, in a thing that you could call a rock band, I guess it would pass a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. And I remember this one time we had a performance where the lead singer, a guy with a super amazing bass voice was uh, doing a cover of, I don't know, probably Presley at the time, I don't remember. Um, but he, you know, he was not very great with lyrics and so he wrote everything down on a piece of paper but didn't realize the lights wouldn't be on all the time while he was singing. So in the middle of a song, he dumps his mic into my hand, he runs and flees, I'm singing this song, and then I turn around, the song's over, but then the drummer is gone, but the two singers have a drumstick each and they're playing the drum kit. I don't know what happened to it there. And all you do is you turn around and they give you the sheepish grin, right? And you look, and they diffuse the moment almost immediately. To the audience, this was spectacular. Like, what is going on on stage as a circus? But, you know, there was a support system over there. There was a bunch of people that truly trusted each other. They, we knew we messed up and we knew we had to go fix it, but there was no point in just yelling at each other or whatever. They just, big grin, what do you do? You melt. Um, similarly, I then eventually moved to theater. Now, this is... Uh, I would not be, ex <laughs> these people are still my friends, I can't believe it, but um, uh, the second act of the play that we did, is a huge play, big, big audience, the first ever time we had rehearsed it end-to-end -end was on stage during the premiere, so <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> there was a lot of guts we had to even put it on that day, but um, to a lot of people, it was horrendous, <laughs> it really, you know, in some ways it was. Um, it, we had a chase scene at the end, and the lead actor ran back on stage, and everybody else had already finished their curtsies and, le curtsies and left, so literally that's how badly coordinated we were. But there was a small pocket of people there, a small pocket, right, including people in my family, including friends, certain friends of mine, who absolutely had my back, because what they said was, this is not about the play, but look what she just did. She opened a market for amateur performers in this city that has never been done before. But they found a way to make it. And, you know, suddenly you find that in the, in the most, you know, unexpected areas, you will have people that have your back. So go to your support system. This doesn't necessarily mean you're a boss all the time. So if you mess up, it's okay. There are still people who will have your back for you. You got to go find them. And the third thing I'd say is actually more serious, like in work. Um, I just talked to you about like transforming cloud into something that was, you know, like something that Google is not accustomed to being. And to ask thousands of people to do things a different way, you know, you can go about it two ways. I would go went about it the first way, which is, you know, you yell at everyone and say, yes, go change. We are all going to be different and we're going to produce this thing. We got yelled at. <laughs> thank you, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly that didn't work and it was, a, you know, it was very public, like the way that played out was very, very public and it was, it was rough because you feel like you've lost your credibility or your stand or whatever that is and, you know, it's a gut-wrenching moment for you to accept it. It's a very, very hard thing to accept it. It's not everybody else's fault, it's yours. And, um, and then, you know, resilience is sort of the most important thing there because you spend a full day in bed being sorry for yourself and miserable and wallow and finish all that get out of your system, be lazy as hell for one day, the next day freaking get up and walk, right? Just walk, you'll be okay. Because the next thing I learned is, okay, how do you show empathy? How do you truly understand why everybody is getting mad at this? Why did this fail? And you start going to the root of it. And you'll find very simple, tiny fixes would actually change the story around. And once you start those simple fixes, it didn't take 12 months and 15 months for it to, get, to start moving in a different direction. It literally took two weeks. And two weeks later, everything was so much better. So I'd say failure is you know, like a, the, probably the best indication that you are learning. And if, you know, if you're not failing, you're probably not learning as much as you could be. Okay, since she's passing it to Christina. Thank you. Failure. In lean startup methodology, they say fail early and often. And so I've had a few in my career. And clearly, 
self-inflicted. Like I took jobs that just sounded too good to be true within the same company where, you know, some hiring manager said, Christina, wouldn't this be the greatest thing? Would you do this? And it, it truly sounded awesome. And I sort of didn't think straight about all the ramifications and that whether or not I was really the perfect profile for the job and did take it. And then I had to suffer a year or two through really proving to myself that I could do it. And those were painful experiences. But I think the point was made, if you don't feel that pain and that you're, if you're not scared of failure in your daily job, you're not learning and you're not pushing yourself. Um, acknowledging that is, is key and just like you said, keep going, just keep walking. You get a lot out of it, but don't do it endlessly, right? Because um, that, can, that can be a little too painful in the end. <laughs> the failing part where you still, you know, it, eventually you have to come around and it has to feel like you're, you're there and you're getting it. And I have had at least one job where that never arrived and I thought, okay, then I needed to abandon that idea and um, try something different. The most important thing here is to, ex you, like us individually, have to accept, you know, what has happened and be okay with it, right? The hardest part of failure is, like, we wait, like, it's about other people's opinions. You have to be okay and own it. It's okay, because we all mess up. Everybody messes up. Every single person messes up. So I think if you get past that hurdle, everything else is a piece of cake after that. Okay, so now we're going to up the difficulty of the questions because we're going to invite <laughs> our audience. There's a microphone over there. Um, ask, ask the hardest questions. Um, you can even nominate um, the panelists. So Don't be please go to the mic. <laughs> the first question. Come on, this, this is all about us. So come on, please. Thank you. So this is... Uh, perhaps a little selfish for me, the problem I'm having with my network. Um, I'm about a year and a half out of college, and a lot of my friends and network are finishing their first jobs and are looking to search. Um, they're like worried that they're not staying long enough, and I'm kind of coaching my friends and myself through all of that. Like, what advice would you have uh, in that situation to uh, help your network? Uh, make sure they find good jobs and uh, that they don't leave tech. How would you go about coaching your other friends when you are just the same age as them? I am absolutely convinced that all of you together, collectively, know a lot of people that are not exactly in your career stage, you know, layer, and you can just use the network effect of that. It takes all of us to connect people. It takes all of us to, to remember how oh, we heard there was openings here or something interesting there. And it is almost an exercise of in the evenings taking a little bit of time and grooming your LinkedIn network, really um, getting people together and find each other. And I think more so for those of us who are in the business for a long time already to really carve that out. But I also encourage you and everybody in, that is at that career stage to reach out to people like us. Cold calls on LinkedIn, they are fine, totally fine. It, it, the worst that can happen is you get no response, but you will get a response from many. Thank you. Hi, I had a question about sponsorship. Um, so I think one of you talked about mentorship versus sponsorship. How do you go about finding a sponsor? How do you actively pursue trying to find, a, find one? I'll give my answer and then I would um, like actually to. Actually, I have uh, one more part of that. Yeah. What is a sponsor, like what are the traits of a sponsor? What should you look for and then how do you go about finding it? I'll give you then my perspective of having been sponsored. So in the, in the companies that I've worked in, well, mainly the other company that I worked in before coming to Google, there was an active sponsorship program. So executives uh, would all pick up a fairly large group of more junior management and also individual contributors' talent um, to actively sponsor them through the career stages. 
And these people would openly advocate for you and uh, during performance reviews and other critical moments. They would look out for jobs for you. It was it literally sometimes a moment where one of these sponsors would then call and say, Christina, there's a job opportunity here in my division. Here's the three options you have. Which one would you like? Right? That's amazing. And other times where I experienced it, it would be things like, well, you just got promoted and you never thought you actually were ready for it or you know it, it was already time or you never even asked for it but your sponsor was pushing for it in the context of the cohort of the talent that was being managed right and so the other part that you were asking and I, i'd like to really also hear melody um, her perspective on it because she is actively sponsoring people but uh, the other part of it is you know you need to how do you find that right and and if you know that that exists, and in all big companies this kind of thing exists, how do you get plugged into it? That's a little bit harder. It's, it's very difficult for the individual to plug yourself into it. I don't exactly know how to do that myself. I have always been plugged into it from other sides. So for that, I'll hand off to Melody. So this is a, this is a great topic. I, I just want to go back to mentoring. So just, I, th I sort of think of mentoring, allies, and sponsorship. Um, mentors, I strongly believe, we are all mentors. We can all mentor at every time. It's, about, it's a matter of being present and being willing to be open uh, and being willing to give to others. So that's kind of my mentoring philosophy. Um, it's not necessarily a matchmaking thing, although sometimes it can turn into that if you continue to invest and you have, you know, you can provide help to each other. Allies are awesome. Again, we are, we can all be allies. We can all get help from allies. I have experienced a huge amount of help from allies when I wasn't on an email thread and they put me on, or I was in a meeting and I said something and was talked over or interrupted, and they amplified, and they came back to what my idea was. And I try and model that. We all can. We all can support each other in that way. Sponsorship is really an active commitment, I think, in many ways, uh, to advocate and to look for opportunities to help other people. And you know, I've had, I've had um, two sponsors where they were pushing me to take jobs. I was like, you're crazy. Like, I'm not a hardware engineer or a network engineer. I don't know why you're telling me to go take this job. But they're like, no, Melody, I know you have something to offer here. I know you can help. And I did it, and I was scared out of my mind. But they kept giving me support, and they were there for me during that process. So I think these are the ways and the context, whatever part of our career we're in, that we can think about how are we receiving help, how are we asking for help. And it does, there's part of this about getting tapped into the network. You have to ask, you have to get out there, you have to make time to meet with people and to network. Um, I have a mentor slash ally slash sponsor um, who is no longer at Google and I make sure I get time with him to have coffee. Um, when I can, you know, every quarter or so. And it's a huge help. He has a perspective of working with me for, you know, over 10 years. I don't know. I just feel really grateful, and I, I offer that to you to think about how can you mentor, how can you be a good ally, um, and, you know, when the time is right, be sponsored, help sponsor someone else. Sorry about my height, but I, I feel definitely motivated by looking at you guys, the best women tech, techies in the world. So it's like even today when people are talking about women in the tech industry, we have uh, women tech makers and stuff like that. When there is some certain case like, say I'm working on a project and I need to uh, implement something that is going to change the whole code and stuff like that. And if I mess it with uh, people saying me not to go through that code, but if I say, yeah, I want to implement that, and I face some errors, and it uh, completely it goes in a different way. And it's going to ruin my whole coding and stuff. So people are pointing at me like, men are going to say, I told you, you cannot uh, do that, but still you do it. So how, how do you guys face those sort of stuff in your industry? Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'll give a little bit of uh, insight uh, from my side because I, I you know, I, I can actually reflect myself in some of the uh, questions that uh, you are asking. I think, uh, you know, looking back at uh, my career, I think 
like when we were talking about failures, actually, if I look back at my failures, actually, I think my biggest failure, it was not to take more risk. And that being because I didn't feel I had the confidence or the ability. I always felt like I had to have 100% of the answers in order to actually achieve something. That hurt me. So I want to give that insight so uh, you reflect through that and be realistic of your capabilities. And if you don't see, if, if you think you cannot get that view, I encourage you to go through your support channels to your allies to actually give you a reality check of where you are in terms of your skill sets and the uh, projects that you are tackling. And I think going through some uh, self-reflection, you can assert yourself and through your support and through your allies, uh, giving you the confidence to take those challenges. Of course, we need to be realistic as well. Like there's times in which you, need, you, you might not be uh, completely there, but I want you to check around for that and find people that can support you in taking on those challenges because I think otherwise you might make uh, a mistake, you know, being too fearful of getting there. Definitely, I'll check on that. And one more thing, like, uh, I'm the lead head of Women Tech Makers at GDG Vermont. Is there a way I can get in touch with you, any of you, just to speak with the women who code around? Well, I, I'm not based in the US, so that's <laughs> probably not the right one to ask. But the other thing I'd say is to actually believe in yourself. Um, one of the things that I constantly suffer from is I'm always kind of not, not believing in my capabilities. So I have a great manager who's always kind of saying, come on, Grace, it's you. Um, so I always am looking inwardly um, sometimes, but I think I've got over it. I, I take a lot of risks, I think. Um, when I started out in my career, I was a bit like, I know, so I was like, can I do that? Can I not do that? I think I stayed a chemist way too long because it was too comfortable. And now that I've got jobs where I'm constantly stretching myself, it's so much more fulfilling. So you will fail. You will have people who kind of try and undermine you. But you've got to believe in yourself. I definitely agree. Failure is a stepping stone to success. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and to answer your earlier question, feel free to reach out to us. I think you know, LinkedIn is a great place. You can look us up. And yeah. we, we can you know, either speak at your event or find other women we know in our network that's in the location you want. For sure. Thank you. Yeah, and also just one side story to tell, we are, you know, presented technical sessions at, at this uh, GCP Next. What I found was other women started preparing their slides two months ahead, and we started doing our dry rounds. We did multiple of them. We, uh, we feel so underprepared. We're so stressed. We're going to forget our line. And the men were writing their slides 24 hours before the session, <laughs> and they felt great. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. First of all, a big shout out to Google. Um, we have seen, like, so much of uh, diversity and inclusion in this uh, conference. And I want to know how they did it. Um, I'm leading a tribe network in our company, and I want to make this happen in our company and in every company. So I would be happy to know how Google has done this. I, I'm going to actually ask Melody for the proper answer because she's involved in a truckload of these things too, because tough questions go there. I will say this from an individual storyline though, um, and it kind of ties multiple things that you all said together earlier. Um, I think that through the entire course of my career at Google, I've had some very serious supporters, right? And not because I went and asked them for it, right? And I started doing well. And like, if I got stuck, I mean, okay, I look like I'm always, you can tell what I'm feeling almost immediately when you look at my face. So, um, so they can tell I'm flustered or I'm trapped or whatever. And there's always someone who'll come and pull out. And this is both men and women in both directions. They were both undermining people and they were both supporting. So I had folks all over the place. But I'd say that over the years, the commitment that our leadership has made to it is kind of actually pretty stunning. Um, and not just that, right? We learn, we're learning too that the, uh, it, the literature is not crystal clear. Like people use many terms sort of interchangeably, diversity versus inclusion versus respect. These are very, very different concepts. They're all related. And one category of people could feel all three, like, you know, they could feel variations of all three. So it took us a while to even understand what those concepts were, to understand what bias meant. And so we started pushing a lot of, you know, curriculum in that general direction just for exposure so everybody understood what was going on. And then I think, um, you know, you start a little snowball running downhill and picks up momentum very quickly. But I really want Melody to speak to this as well. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Ray, because we wouldn't all be here. Yeah. 
So Ray said, hey, do you have like 10 minutes to talk? <laughs> and I said, yeah, what's going on? And she said, listen, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the program and it's a great program here at Next. And I think we, need, we can do something else in addition to it. And so Ray really pulled this together. And I think I, I give that as an example of when you care about something and you want to help elevate voices and have a conversation, you can make it happen. Mm -hmm. And we pushed through some obstacles to make this happen today in this room so we could all hear from each other. But that's, that's the spirit of it. And I think you can have that at your company and the yeah. events that you're doing and the culture that you're trying to create. It, it really does start with that. Yeah. I um, asked Melody, what if people tell us no? She told me, you just keep asking. Yeah. And just to give an example, I think this conference also, like, I did not know that the company was coming here. All were, like, men. And I just Googled I, I, that I wanted to go to this conference, and I asked for it, and I'm here now. So, yeah. Great. Great. So there have been times, too many times, that I've witnessed a, a female peer, whether that be a friend or coworker, be the target or the victim of presumption or prejudice or intolerance in some form. But I'm oftentimes hesitant in how best to respond for fear of, in responding, taking her voice or taking her agency in that form or otherwise putting her in the hot seat. Do you have any advice or inputs on how best I can be an ally while also while being both useful and respectful? Grace, do you want to speak to that? That's a tough one. Um, first of all, it depends on how well you know the person. Okay, so if you know them well enough, um, maybe have a coffee or a, a drink and just kind of say, look, I've, I've noticed X, Y, Z. Because um, it could come off inadvertently if you jump in into the meeting exactly as you've pointed out, that you're talking over them, you're, 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 you're going to say something that others will listen to when it was her, the, her idea. Um, I've been in that situation before as well. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's awkward. Awkward for the person who thinks they're trying to help and awkward for the person you've tried to help and now is feeling totally undermined. It, it, it really does depend, but... I'd say get to know them first because some people like to push their way through it. Um, it depends on the situation I am. Sometimes I just like to deal with it myself. Other times my very, very protective team will, will jump in for me, um, you know, but that, that's fine. They know me, but, you know, they all kind of know when not to step in because they know I'm big enough to, to look after myself. But for junior uh, members of the team... They need, they need help, they need allies from everywhere, and you should get to know them first. I'd like to add something to that. If it's, it depends on the situation, right? But if it's, for example, in a meeting and something happened there, and you don't, because of the reasons that Grace just mentioned, don't want to step in, um, you may have an opportunity later on to take on the person that was maybe voicing something or you know acting in a certain way one-on-one. -on -one. Because I, what I notice is not a lot of people have the heart to just sit down with that person and say, hey, you know, in this meeting I noticed you do these kinds of things. I saw this type of behavior that made me feel uncomfortable on behalf of another person in the room. That is so incredibly powerful if done correctly and if done kindly as well as feedback. I think that's a game changer because I think for people who do these types of things, they, it's very uncomfortable if they are being like found later by someone like you and confronted about it. Not a lot of people do that. And that is extremely powerful because it's more about you than how you felt in that moment and less about the other person that you're trying to protect. Thank you. Hello there, I'm Pooja, I'm the engineering tech lead at a healthcare tech startup called Qantas. So uh, Silicon Valley has seen an amazing transformation in the past few years and uh, you know, uh, I have seen how that has influenced my career and how it has you know, helped me. Uh, you have more diversity programs, you have more supportive programs and you have more uh, nonprofits uh, helping women in tech. But how do we ensure that this doesn't change into a dialogue of preferential treatment. Now, let me let me uh, also mention why this is important. Uh, quite often, when uh, you know, 
before that. So women engineers are nerds. Women engineers are geeks. They work twice as hard as pretty much every other engineer there's out there. And when uh, someone is up for promotion, uh, you know, quite often you get questions around, oh, you actually got a promotion because they want to increase the number of women on the panel. And uh, even if you hear like a comment around that, it undermines your capabilities. It undermines your strengths. So how do we actually ensure that, you know, we don't change the dialogue around that. I'll just say a very little personal thing right now and then I'll pass it on to who has more professional way of answering the question. The, the personal, my personal reaction is tiny violins, you know. If, if I hear something like that, I see, I hear tiny violins and I'm thinking, whatever, noise cancellation, but that's just me. <laughs> I, I, um, you asked two questions in there, and the first one was about preferential treatment explicitly, and I would say that it, in both directions, I believe that we have to give everybody the right opportunity. I genuinely believe that to be the case. I do think that there are some disadvantages that different people have. I want to use a, um, I'll use examples. There are very, very shy men on my team that won't speak up, right? and they don't sometimes get exposure to things that I really genuinely believe they ought to. There are both men and women who work round the clock for certain things, right? They're just like overachievers all over the place. Every people work a lot. Um, and I, I'm, I don't know if there's like a single systemic solution I can come up with. For my part as the leader of a team, I do try to make sure that the, the playing field is even. So anyone who seems to be disadvantaged in any way gets, like, you know, that part of it addressed. Um, I, I'm looking to others to see if there's more systemic ways to. Yeah, I think you answered it well. Thank you so much. Okay, one last question before we um, have to conclude the session. <laughs> but we will all be here. You can find us on LinkedIn, so it's not the end of the conversation. There's a lot of pressure to make this one count then. You, you're going to ask the best question. <laughs> First of all, um, I want to thank you all for taking the time. And this is one of the sessions where it's all gr mostly women in PAC Wealth Wall, so it's nice to see that. Um, my question is a little bit different. Um, I've been in Silicon Valley for almost two decades. And, but in the last several years, came a point in my life where I had to take time off, take care of family, um, elderly parents who got sick or a significant other. And what I'm struggling with is actually what to write in LinkedIn. You know, I, I was in doing cloud stuff, you know, over 10 years ago, but now I have to put that gap there. And I find that these, um, AI systems are probably skipping me by because of that lag. So how do I get the attention of Google recruiters? <laughs> um, what, what, what advice do you give for that? And also, there's obviously been a change in salary since I departed with the economy the way it is. Um, you know, you can look on salary.com and stuff, but it's not the most accurate representation. And um, we need to earn more than we already are. So if you guys can speak to that, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, I think, y you know, um, I'll tell a story. Uh, I've encountered s many, many examples throughout my career where uh, there's personal choices that need to be made that are really important, right? Um, family, uh, immediate family, extended family. And uh, in my interactions with my coworkers, uh, you know, there's a lot, there can be a lot of fear around that, you know, needing to go part-time because of uh, requirements outside. And I feel really grateful Google offers really good, great, really great programs around flexibility for that. Uh, but I think, you know, from a perspective of re-entering the market, it's everyone, I would imagine a lot of people have examples like this. I've had examples where my personal life took priority over my work life. Um, and I think you know, being able to tell your story and tell the tell the reasons why. Around LinkedIn, I, I'm not, I, you know, I would, if, if someone here hasn't, does anyone here have some suggestions to help out around LinkedIn positioning? Awesome, so you should connect, connect after we wrap up. I think um, trying to present that in a way that's real, because this happens, 
right? It happens in, in the industry. Uh, and so I think telling that story and being real about it and being real about you have strengths and capabilities that are valuable now, right? Um, that's part of the story for you to tell. Um, I also have a, it's not a directly in tech um, sort of story, but it is relatable in the sense that um, when I tried to graduate, like I told you, I talk in jest about all this cool stuff that I did. But while I did that cool stuff, basically all my peers, all my friends had graduated and gone into better jobs. So basically, I was the school dropout, right? And I had to catch up because eventually I had to go to school and finish grad school or whatever. I was many, many years behind my peers at the time. But you take what, like at the time, my story is that I took what I got, right? I think sort of very, very entry level sort of positions or whatever. And I had to relearn a lot of things. But it hasn't stopped me because I did catch up. And in fact, you know, I outran people that at different points in their lives. So I'm saying my personal story would say not to be discouraged very much if that became the situation because there is, you know, there is like the, a, a tipping point, if you will. You just have to, you know, s stay focused and find it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is the end of our time, um, but let's continue the conversation. Reach out to us. Uh, there are many tech women communities where we can continue to have this conversation. Um, um, to conclude the session, I would like to go through our panelists. Uh, each one of you, please leave us with um, a sentence of wisdom. <laughs> oh, all of a sudden, I have the microphone in a hurry. I, I just say, keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. You're all here. You are all here. Look at all of you. It's, you're an amazing group, and it's, it's lovely to be here and have a little chat with you. And you are the people who make me keep going, and that's a fabulous feeling. I'd say just be unafraid to try almost anything once. Like, just have no fear. Be courageous. And even if you trip over, it's okay. Come back. And you have the strength, for sure. All we need is a tiny bit of courage. Work on the things that uh, tap into your passion, that you can connect your heart with, um, that you can connect your curiosity and your intellect with. I think that's when we do our best work. So uh, I think on the uh, spirit of uh, resilience as well, uh, one of the things that uh, helped me is, um, is uh, to think that there's not uh, good or bad decisions, like you make what that decision is, and that keeps you kind of making the best of each opportunity that you encounter in life. That's helped me a lot. Clipper stole mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I, I, <laughs> I'd, I'd just say, um, again, believe in yourself. Um, don't let doubt creep in. Um, yeah, really. But again, Cripper did steal mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you.